All right, thank you. All right, if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and lift up your Bibles, whether it is electronic or whatever it is. You still have a Bible version, your version there. So, and let's say this, let's declare this. I believe that my Bible is the living word of God. It inspires me, guides me, and leads me in timeless truth. It has the authority to save me and to deliver me. It has the power to heal me and to restore me and set me free. Amen. Amen. That's exactly what the Bible is all about. Jesus came to set us free, heal us, deliver us, restore us. Amen. The title of my message this morning, Suffering Leads to Resurrection. Suffering leads to resurrection. You know, Jesus Christ, in that day when he began his trip to Jerusalem, the Bible says that he rode on a donkey, a mule. It was called the triumphant entry into Jerusalem because they were throwing palm, tree, palm leaves and shouting out, Hosanna! to the King of Kings, and glory to God in the highest. And so our t- my text is found in Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. I'm reading in the New Living Translation, and it says here, verse 1, And Jesus said, And Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem. They came to a town called Bethage, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of them to go on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs them. And he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that, uh, that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming, humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. And so this is a prophecy that was in Zechariah, and they were declaring this, and so it needed to be fulfilled. So the two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him, and they threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in uproar as he entered. Who is this? they asked. And the crowds replied, It is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Suffering leads to resurrection. They had no idea what was happening. They thought that Jesus was entering into Jerusalem to deliver them from all of their trials and all of their struggles and all of the the rule over the Roman Empire. This is an and this was we as we over here we celebrate this as an annual event. Annual event of Jesus' activities leading up to his resurrection. Starting right from today, Palm Sunday, and then comes ahead with Good Friday, and then Saturday, the burial, and then the resurrection day, Sunday. This week that many times we, we just want to get through because it's full of pain. Many countries in the world, some places, they actually do 
the walk. They walk in different places and, and, and they set up uh, prayer paths and, and sometimes even, even to the extent of actually beating themselves and, and ripping their bodies and, and things and torture and pain, afflicting pain on themselves. But that's not what Jesus was saying here. We see Jesus entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, but he doesn't put down the Romans and restore David's empire that they wanted. They wanted to see David's rule come back again. Just like the disciples wanted the same thing. We see him behind in the room with with Mary, as Mary anointed his feet, weeping. She had a clue about what was going to happen before the burial. It's the only time when you anoint somebody with the anoint- ointment. And she was anointing his feet and crying and weeping and wiping her tears off his feet with her hair. We see him in the dining room with with the closest of his disciples and prophesying and telling them of his death and his burial. And he also spoke about the betrayal. We see him grieving in the Garden of Gethsemane as he lays down his desires for us. And then finally he takes on the sin of the world He became sin for us on the cross of Calvary. As we look back on these moments knowing and these events, knowing that the end result is the resurrection. We know that. We believe that and we read about it. But at that time, the disciples had no clue. They were like confused they were confused and they were in trouble. They, were, they did not know what the Lord was talking about. But it is good for us as Christians today, as believers, to embrace the suffering of Jesus as well so that we can fully embrace the joy of his resurrection, of what he went through. Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, saying, If we die with him, we also live with him. It's like, Pastor, what are you saying? We die with him. We die with him in the flesh. Because when we, we accept and we receive Jesus into our lives and we say we make him Lord and master of our lives, what we're saying to him is that, Lord, I want you to take full control of my life. Lead me. You have saved me. I believe. I confess my sins to you. I confess everything that I've that I've that I've wronged you and hurt you. Save me. The blood of Jesus that washes your word says, though our sins may be as scarlet, yet they shall be white as snow. You wash all of our sins away, and you take in everything all of our transgressions and equities. And so when that happens, and when we take the Lord into our lives, now we tell the Lord, you rule over us, which means you are no longer in control of your life. You are no longer in control. You are dead to sin. And if, you, if, I, if I may say this, it's like you should be able to, in time, be transformed to a place where you do not sin. Yes, we are in this carnal body and we are walking this face of the earth and we may falter and fall at times, but there is something that we used to do in the past that God forgave us and delivered us from and we can't go back to it, church. We can't do that because then we are telling the Lord, is Lord, I have accepted you and received you, but at this point, a week later, if we go back to it, we're saying, Lord, it, you know what? I really didn't mean that. I really didn't mean that. 
And so what we're saying is we're dead to him. Paul's saying we die with him, we also live with him. How do we live with him? Because we live for him then. Because in everything that he wants us to do, we accomplish. It's his will and for his purposes. Remember Pastor Cheryl talked about his purposes last Sunday. It's all for his purposes. Many of us ask things or we want things to take place in our lives, but we don't look at it. God, is it going to bring you glory and honor? Is it for your purpose? Is it for your will? Your will be done. See, Jesus, when he taught the disciples to pray, he says, Our Father in heaven, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done in our lives. What you're saying is, God, whatever is your will, be done in my life. First Peter chapter 4, verse 13 puts it this way. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering. See, we all love Resurrection Sunday. We all love the time that Christ rose from the dead, and yes, it is a must because he is alive and we celebrate that. And because he is alive, we are alive too. But we do not remember what it took the Lord Jesus. The Bible says that he gave his life for a ransom for many. That he laid it down. He laid his life down. And that's it. Peter is talking about, he says, these trials make you partners in, with Christ in his suffering. So if you're struggling, and if you're suffering some things for Christ's sake, then know that it's counted worthy for him. Amen? The next part of that verse says, so that you, have, you, so that you will have wonderful joy of seeing his glory. And when it is revealed to all the world. His glory is revealed through us. Because we live for him. It's his life. Living in and through us. The Bible says in the book of Acts. We live and move and have our being in him. Through the Holy Spirit. Amen. So because this week. We know that our suffering has a purpose. So this morning I'm talking to you about suffering leads to resurrection. So if you want resurrection power in your life, you're going to have to go through some sufferings. Amen. Gold and silver, why are they called precious metals? They go through intense heat and hammering down and thing. Iron, right? goes through heat, purification, separation of the impurities. You are consecrated. You have given your life to the Lord. And you say, God, I am giving my life to you. And so you no longer do the things that you so desire. So this morning, I want to put a challenge to you. Can you see yourself in the story of Palm Sunday? Jesus entering Jerusalem in a triumph and in praise and, and the fulfilling prophecies and the hope of his followers with the zeal that he had and then he comes into Jerusalem only to walk into the temple and see what was happening and taking place. If you read that whole chapter in Matthew 21, he walked in the temple and he cleansed the temple of all the greedy false religion and leaders and the buying and selling of things that were taking place in the temple. And he said, you have made this place a den of thieves when this place is supposed to be a house of prayer. And if I may say so, church, I've said it before, but I'm just going to say it again because as I was preparing this message, the Lord was impressing on my heart so do you see yourself on Palm Sunday? And I said, yes, Lord. And many of us 
many of us, including myself sometimes, we come in here with thoughts from the outside, and we say, God, we're here to worship you and pray where we cannot sit or we cannot stay in one place or just stay to say, God, I'm here in the fear and in reverence of you, of who you are in worship. I've said this before, you know, what if the Lord told us that sometime it's like, before we walk in here, we're going to take off our shoes. Would you do it? If the Lord said it. Many religions other than the Jewish faith, I mean, other than the Christians, the Jewish faith, the Hindus, the Muslims, Islamic faith, they never walk into the holier place or the, their house of worship with their shoes on. The disciples, Jesus washed their feet because they walked in different places and the dust and dirt and that they carried through. And he said, I wash your feet. And sometimes, and that's what they do. The Muslims, when they go to the mosque, they wash their feet and they wash their hands. I always wondered about that, why just this portion? Isn't it all this portion? But they do this. And then their face and their feet when they walk in for prayer. We have become so casual toward the living God the one that gave it all and laid it down for us. And because of him, we have eternity. He cleansed the temple. Pontius Pilate entering into Jerusalem, if I picture that, bringing Roman occupiers, I'm thinking, Lord, what if it was him coming in? Maybe it would have been a great showdown of Jesus and the Messiah, the one that the Jews were looking for to deliver it, them from, deliver them from all of the oppression of the Europe, of the Roman kingdom. Or was it a great showdown between the Romans and the Jews? No, but then I felt like Jesus pulling me aside. And he tells me, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to Jerusalem not to conquer, not for war, not for violence, but to be willing to give my life to the conquerors, the ones that are conquering, and the rulers, and the Romans, and the religious leaders. I'm going to Jerusalem to give my life, to die, to suffer. And as I pondered on that question, do I see myself on Palm Sunday? The next question that came up to me, would you, what would be your response towards it? I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying that and I challenge you this morning. What would be your response Maybe like Peter is like, would say, is like, oh, Lord, no, you're not going to do it. Are you sure this is what's supposed to happen? No, you're not going to do that. Victory is ours. You know, I love it in The Chosen, in one of the scenes, I forget, where he says, we're going to go, and then he, he literally does this. All right, Jesus, let's go. Do it. Right? Jesus, uh, Peter does that. I love it when he talks about it. And it's like, Jesus, calm down. Right? <laughs> Peter. He just wants to go and take care of it. This time we win, Jesus. We go. We, we got it covered. We saw Lazarus raised from the dead. What are you talking about dying? You raised Lazarus. Why, what are you going to be doing? Dying. He saw Mary wiping the feet of Jesus. And he declares she is anointing me. Not to rule, not for come claiming the very throne of David, but for death, but for burial. You may think right now and say, Pastor, boy, this is Palm Sunday. What are you doing? What are you talking about? Suffering leads to resurrection. Why the somber atmosphere? 
Isn't it Palm Sunday? We're supposed to be entering victoriously. Why then the sadness and talk of death? Because it took his death for us to be here to celebrate Palm Sunday today. See, Jesus felt the weight of the world, the Bible says. He felt the sins of the world upon him. And when I was preparing this message, I truly, truly say to you, and certainly felt a mood shift in the room when I was preparing to see the grief in Jesus' eyes. This Jesus, the Father of pouring out the love, this Yahweh revealing himself to me and to you this morning, the weight of it all that we feel and sense this beauty of the timeless self-existent of one, the one and only God and his very nature that sustains the universe and that created us in his likeness and in his image, still said, I will give my life to them that they may be saved. See, 2,000 years ago, he did that. 2,000 years ago, he is. 2,000 years in the future, he still is. Existing in this very moment, external moment, and we have a part of that to share with him. The one who holds all things together by his word. His word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our pathway. It's one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. The one is suffering and grieving and embracing the week of pain that he has to go through from Palm Sunday to Good Friday. But we have the Holy Spirit to help us Help us understand because the Passover celebration with the Messiah and his disciples was a time to remember that Yahweh delivered, them, delivered us from our slavery in Egypt and brought us into the land of promise. And we have that promise through the Holy Spirit to understand and know that God has saved us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light. He has redeemed us by the blood of Jesus, paid in full. Nothing that we can do to change that. This is our annual feast day that unites us as a people of God, as a church that brings hope, as Jesus tells us that this Passover that he had with the disciples, the last one, was a different Passover. Remember the time, he said, it's different. He's talking about death again, his death. He's asking us to see the bread and in his own body broken. To see the wine, not as wine, as a celebration of time during Christmas or New Year's or weddings or whatever time we celebrate it with, but as a picture of his blood poured out completely on humanity. As I was preparing, I felt the weight of this, and I said, God, God's been speaking to me, and I've just, we had our council meeting yesterday in a lot of churches, and we talk about the bread and the cup, the wine, as emblems and symbols. But the Lord has been speaking to me and pointing to me very directly and saying, because Jesus spoke about it, he says, this is my body. This is my blood. You will not hear us saying that again. It's a symbol. 
because we need to understand what we're doing and participating and what we're taking care of. It's Jesus said that this is my body that is broken for you. Just as he's demonstrating the bread, as he broke it and gave it to disciples, he said in that last Passover meal that he had, this is my body, this is what's going to happen to my body. That you may be made whole in all of your sickness, in all of your diseases, in all of your infirmities. By my stripes, you will be made whole. Church, it's either we, believe, we do believe it or we don't. Because that's the word of God. This is my blood. And you drink of it. It brings salvation, redemption. It's in blood. It, it, he signed a new covenant with us in his blood. All of the other benefits that we have that comes with it to salvation. Because we are kids, because we are his children, we benefit certain things. Amen? What is it, the first thing that we go when we go for a job interview? And we talk to them and they say yes. And after they all cleared up everything and they say, okay, what are my benefits? What are my benefits? Oh, you have two weeks of vacation. If you're in Australia, it is 30 days, right? <laughs> or if it's any other part of the world, which we should be all living. America is like slave drives you, right? Or you have health benefits, you have dental, you have vision. God says this, Jesus says, in my blood, you have healing, you have redemption. Everything that you ask the Father in my name is yours. To do the will for his purposes and for his glory, for his honor. That the Father in heaven may be glorified, amen. I'm sure they felt the darkness come in that room. Everyone around them at that table while they were talking and laughing and all of a sudden, zoom, right? Just their power batteries just coming down, trying to understand this. Master, Jesus, Rabbi, what are you saying? We're having a great feast right now and you're just ruining it, killing it. <laughs> As we say, you're a bus killer, right? <laughs> Those words. But what is this weight that Jesus was carrying? So intense, this grief. The Bible says that his capillaries burst with his own sweat like blood. We see our Savior in the Garden of Gethsemane experiencing the pain, the turmoil, awful weight of what he is living through. While I was preparing this message, like I said earlier, I could feel it. And I pray this morning that you feel it. This is our God, church. This is our Savior. Giving up himself, his questions, desires, his hope of change to exchange for submitting to the will of the Father. Many have prayed for many, even overseas, they come up and they say, Pastor, pray, pray for the will of God in my life. Right here is his will. Give up everything. Give up everything. You know, the Bible talks about this, Jesus talks about it in that same passage. Rich Rangula comes to him and says, what do I need to do to follow you? He says, go sell all of your things and come follow me. The Bible says that he left, he walked away from the Lord, saddened, because it was too much for him to give up. Yet Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you take up my cross and follow me. We read the first passage in, in Timothy where he says, to die in Christ is to live in his gain. Submitting to the will of the Father. 
some words over here that I read, someone written. Just as Jesus' suffering was leading to re- Jesus' suffering was leading to resurrection, so may ours. When victory is not is not happening, <laughs> when our questions are unanswered, when the pain doesn't go away and our healing does not happen. We see Jesus walking with us through suffering. He has not left us in our pain. He has given us an understanding for suffering if we have eyes to see it through the eyes of Jesus. I am reminded of the creation about the account that is in Genesis when the earth was without form, void, broken, and un. Formed, remember that? Genesis 1.1. The Holy Spirit arrives to that place of confusion and hovers around the earth, the Bible says, over the face of the waters. In that turmoil and our suffering, our void and our confusion, if we invite the Holy Spirit into the middle of our situations and our trials and struggles, I believe, church, that our sufferings will be sanctified. They'll be sanctified just as in the book of Genesis. Purpose is introduced into our pain and confusion. And that life and resurrection and creation will come from it through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is a glorious week this glory and holy week as we go out of here this morning with Palm Sunday, knowing that Jesus walked in victoriously at the time they didn't know it. They saw him crucified. They saw him buried. And they thought their world was come to an end until Resurrection Sunday. Suffering leads to resurrection. That because Jesus laid everything down and as as a result gave birth to a new world, a new hope, a new way, a new way for people, for us, so we can, by his spirit, indwell spirit in us, embrace everything, all of that he has gone through, Embrace it with the same heart that the Lord went through and then join him in his suffering and in his resurrection. Amen? Amen. Both on the day of his return, we will experience it. The Bible says that. But how about the here and now? Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. While it's great, that we are saved and sanctified and when Jesus comes, I'm going to, and if I'm not alive, I'll be resurrected and I'll rise up with him and be caught up in the clouds and that's great and when he comes, I'll be raptured up. But how about the here and now? How about the here and now? Walking through it, experiencing it, our sufferings reframed in his beauty of Christ alone. In Christ alone, we sing that song, I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Holy Spirit, help us. Where in your own life are you seeing loss? Where are you experiencing unrelenting pain? In those places of sickness and struggles and confusion of what's happening around the world and in our lives today, in those places when you cry out to God for God's kingdom to come as it is in heaven, yet you aren't seeing it. The psalmist says, Psalms 90 verse 12, New King James Version, it says, teach me, 
Teach us. You can personalize it. Teach me to number our days, number my days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. The wisdom of the Lord. Let's be honest with ourselves and with God. Yes, we believe that God heals, delivers, and redeems, and his kingdom has come. Yet, there are times in our vic- that where victory does not seem to come right away. And we tend to fall apart and fade and not trust the one that gave it all. But with Jesus in Gethsemane, we kneel with him and lay down our questions to surrender our desires to fall, so to speak, on the sword of his love in our lives and put to death this life that so ensnares us. The Hebrews talks about it. We lay aside every weight that ensnares us, that sets trap, the enemy sets up traps for us. We lay it aside. We put them to death. We open our hearts to receive whatever the Father has for us. Surely, living with family, the universe is shaken. We are going through experiences, chaos, all of that stuff. But I tell you, as much as, as it's heavy on our hearts and all of this stuff that's going on, it's really heavy on my heart to see the lost come to the Lord. And both you and me have a part of it. Each one of us. Each one of us has a place in this. Because he's coming back for the bride. And we are his bride, the church, the bride of Christ, which is without spot, without blemish, which is pure, set apart for him. Amen. So suffer if you're suffering the losses and pain, yet turn toward Jesus Christ instead of rejecting. We trust him even when it seems led to us that in pain we don't want to do certain things. In other words, in this great story of Jesus' life and understanding and the writing in the, in the tears as we write and, and pray through all of this, it's God, not my will, Lord. Not my will, Lord. But yours be done. Yours be done in my life today. Into death. Your life. And with your life we are resurrected. Amen? Amen. Suffering leads to resurrection. Psalmist echoes these words in Psalms 23 verse 4. And we all know this so well. Even when I walk through the darkest valley... I will not be afraid, for you are close to me. On Friday, I was telling them, it's like, we know it is, even though I walk through the shadow, the valley of death. Know that it's just a shadow. It's just a shadow. The valley of shadow of death. It's really not the real thing, but we want to believe it, right? We're fearful. As I come to a close this morning, I want to read to you one final passage. God offers comfort to all of us. All of us. We have the same comfort, the same Holy Spirit, each one of us. And it's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 7. And I'm just going to read it to you. And this is what he's saying. All praise to God, the Father, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. It's like the more you want Christ, in your life, the more you're going to suffer. <laughs> right? It's like, no, Lord, that's not how it should work. But that's what he's saying here. 
The more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. We are confident that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort God gives us. God's comfort is upon you. Would you stand this morning as I close in a prayer that I want to read out to you? And if you would just have your eyes closed, if you want to raise your hands just to the Lord, I just feel like it's a time that we just say, God, in closing, that you will make this your prayer. Lord Jesus, we choose to embrace this week with you. To let you wash our feet to see your grief and not rebuke it. We kneel with you in Gethsemane and say, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In my pain, in my healing, in my loss, in my gain, in my waiting, in my victory, in the valley and on the mountain top. Let your will be done. Holy Spirit, teach us this week to see the sufferings through the lens of this holy week of the Holy Spirit. Help us to see with new eyes that with you, suffering always leads to resurrection. We thank you for the resurrection. We thank you for the suffering. And we too know, God, that we also join in with you and crucify this flesh that we may live for you, with you forever. To God be the glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.